So I've been thinking about it and I kind of realized I'm a bit of a hypocrite because I was doing daily music production tips every single day of January and most of those were about saving time in the studio, doing things smarter, but I kind of ignored the biggest time saver of them all. And to be honest, it's something I've been ignoring for quite a while. But in this video today, I wanna to fix that. I'm gonna make my very first from scratch 2020 Ableton template. So if you've watched any of my previous videos, you'll probably notice that I bang on about saving time in the studio. I'm really kind of passionate about making sure that you're kind of making the most of your studio time. So not replicating anything that you do time and time again, or those monotonous tasks that you don't need to be doing that really kind of just stifles your creativity. And one of those things that I've never kind of talked about is templates. Now, when I kind of make music, I, no matter what software that I'm using, I never use templates. I always like working from a blank, empty canvas because I just find that I'm not kind of pushed down any particular route when it comes to producing that. I have a full, you know, reign to do whatever I want to, and I'm not kind of confined by certain instruments that I always use, which is why I think a lot of my tracks have different sounds within them because I'm never kind of forced to use the same thing every time. But recently I've been thinking about a different way of kind of creating a template that would give me that quick start, but not necessarily push me down a certain route, which is why I've been thinking more and more about making this video. So in this video, I'm gonna make my very first Ableton template. It seems crazy to say that because I've been using Ableton so long, but this is gonna be my first proper template that I'm actually gonna use in my tracks coming up. Now I see a lot of producers talk about their templates and even give them out on their YouTube channels, but I'm not gonna do that with this one. Instead, I'm actually gonna create this from scratch in this video so you can see how I make it. Now this is important because your template should be unique to you. It shouldn't just be something that you're copying from somebody else because they make great tracks and you wanna make something exactly like them. Your template should make sense to you and it should kind of be informed by your workflow and what makes sense. So by all means, you can follow this along and maybe use some of the settings that I do, but kind of make it your own. Really think about what makes sense to you. Anyway, enough of this talking, let's get straight into it. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna revisit two or three of my latest tracks and figure out what are the common elements that I use in every single track. Now I've got a little notepad here and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make some notes on all the different elements that I kind of see similar in my projects. So things that I always do and I can put them within my template to save me a whole load of time. So this is a recent remix that I kind of did of one of my own tracks for my sets and to be honest, it was done quite quickly. So things haven't been kind of moved around and renamed and kind of, I haven't really kind of organized it the way that perhaps I should do. You can see a lot of stuff around here hasn't been renamed. You know, a lot of these clips are probably not the right color and everything else that I'd normally do. But at least it's kind of given me an idea of all the different things that I might have within my track. Now, one common element that I always have going throughout my track is a vinyl sample of some sort. It gives me that kind of low lo-fi kind of feel. Now, I do tend to use the same sample a lot. It's one that I found in a sample pack quite a while back, but I do change it occasionally when I want to. So maybe just having that vinyl track within there might actually help me. I might put that sample in to start with and that could give me that kind of vinyl bed almost for the track. So that's just an audio channel and it has an EQ on there, just getting rid of some of the bottom end. So that's something that I could put within my template quite easily. Now, next up, I have a bass in here. This is the bass for the track. And for this, I'm actually using Massive. Now, I tend to use a different bass instrument each time, so I can't really just say, okay, I'm gonna always put a Massive instance in there. So maybe that's not a maybe that's not a thing. Maybe I could just put a MIDI channel in there for my bass. So whilst I wouldn't actually put an instrument on this bass channel within my template, what I can do is still put the plugins that I'd normally process that bass with. And one of the things I always put on is Neutron 3. I really love the mix assistant within here. It really helps you kind of fix some problems with the bass and it kind of just I don't know, I find it really, really handy. Now I'd also put an LFO tool on there, which is my kind of side chaining tool of choice. It's, it's one of those things that I've used for just years. I'll put the link in the description to all these plugins if you want to check these out. The LFO tool I always use, and in fact, I think this is probably one of the templates. I think it's the sidechain six template. 
I tweak it a little bit depending on what bass sound it is, but I could easily just put that on my bass channel on my in my template. And that would be a really cool quick start for me. And finally, on that bass channel, I pretty much always put a utility on there because at some point I might want to automate the volume level. So I don't want to do that actually on the volume levels on the right hand side here because I use them for mixing. So I put a utility on there and I automate the gain. So again, putting a utility on there could work quite nicely. Next up, I've got the melody line. And again, this is something that is going to change with every single track. I might put different chords on there. I don't know which chord I put on there. It might be a different one for every single track. It might be a different instrument. Uh, I don't actually have the scale MIDI plugin on here, but the scale plugin might be really handy because I might want to keep within a certain scale for this project. So that might be handy. Uh, the LFO tool, as you can see, is on here. I don't always sidechain the uh, instrument that I'm doing. In fact, I've got a very harsh sidechain on here. I think that's probably because it's a pad like sound. So I'm kind of doing this sidechain kind of effect on it. So I might put the sidechain on here on the actual template, but I might disable it so it's ready to use later. I've got an EQ on here, which is kind of obvious. You would have EQ on pretty much every track anyway. It's got quite a bit of the bottom end cut out, but again, it's going to change for every single instrument. So I'd probably put an EQ8 on there, but just have it on some kind of default settings. The auto filter, definitely, I would definitely have an auto filter on there because I'm always kind of using a low pass filter or a high pass filter on my main kind of keys or whatever I'm doing. So an auto filter would definitely be cool to put on there. Uh, reverb, I can't, I, I, it's one of those things that I wouldn't have on every single instrument. So yeah, I don't know whether I put that on by default. I don't think it's going to save me any time. So I'm not going to bother with a reverb. I wouldn't put a reverb on there. Next up, we have a vocal track within here. Now, depending on the song, I might have vocals in there. I might have vocal chops. I might have a full vocal. So it's really hard to tell from track to track what I'd actually do with vocals. So I'm probably going to leave that blank. I probably won't bother with a vocal track in there and we'll just see how it goes. I've got another vocal track here and another vocal track here. So we're just going to ignore them. That's an effects one. So again, effects are going to change every single track. A shaker of some sort. Got a whole lot of stuff. I'm actually going to bypass all of these kind of effects. They're all just effects. And again, they're going to change with every single track. Okay, next up, the drums. This is where it's, this is probably where I'm going to be able to save some time. So my kick is usually always done with a simpler. I usually have the kick on a track on its own on a MIDI track. And then I've got the simpler lined up with my kick sample in it. So I could actually set up my kick channel with a simpler ready to go. Again, I use Neutron 3, but I actually just use the equalizer on here. I tend to use that quite a bit and this works quite nicely. There's actually Neutron's got a fantastic masking feature within it. So if I have the Neutron EQ on my kick and then I have Neutron on my bass, if I go to my bass patch, for example, in my uh, Neutron equalizer under the masking settings, I can actually see that kick. So I can actually put them side by side, which works really nice when you're trying to carve out some of that EQ to make room for the bass within the kick and vice versa. It works really, really well for that. So using the Neutron 3 equalizer is definitely a must for me. And then also I've got the utility on there, which is again, automating the gain sometimes. So that's definitely something I could drop on there. Uh, I've got the mini clip within here as well with the mini clip is probably going to be really useful because again, I produce house music. So it's always going to be a 4-4 pattern. So I could have a really basic 4-4 pattern going within there. You can see I've kind of, I've altered this slightly. So I've got a couple of double kicks here and a double kick there. Those are things I'm probably going to change on track by track, but I could easily just make a MIDI clip which just has a 4-4 pattern within it. And that would save me a whole load of time. It would give me a quick start. Next up, I've got my drums group. So this is where I kind of keep all the rest of my drums. I actually keep my kick and my the rest of my drums separate. Sometimes I might group them all together after that. So I have my kick grouped with my drums group as well. It depends really. With this one, I kind of did this remix very quickly for my set, so I didn't actually do that. So I just have my drums group here. And then within that, I have all my kind of tops drums. So I have my claps, my hi-hats, my kind of light percussion, everything kind of goes within here. So within this drums group, I might put a whole load of things on here. Uh, within this one, I haven't actually put saturation and saturation is usually something I put on my drums group. So that's not within here. I'm not quite sure why I didn't do it on this occasion. 
But yeah, I probably have that within there. I also have the auto filter on here as well. I tend to use a low pass filter on my drums sometimes in the breakdowns and when I wanna do some interesting effects. So that's a definite must for this drums group. And then I've got a reverb within there. Again, this is something I probably use on the breakdowns to put a whole load of reverb on all the drums. It's just one of those things I probably do with automation. Um, so that's my kind of drums group. And then within each individual drum loop here, we have just an EQ on it for this one. EQ, EQ, EQ. So there's nothing really amazing going on within here. These are all audio channels. So they're all kind of top loops that I've used or individual claps or hi-hats I've kind of merged together. When it comes to my template, I'm probably going to have a drums group and then maybe have maybe five, six channels of audio ready to go with EQs on them perhaps. Next up, I've got a drum fill within here. Now, this is something that I probably don't want to put within my template because I don't want to always be using a drum fill. You know, sometimes I want to do something else with it. I don't want to always have to just rely on having a drum fill there to be the way that I always kind of do my breakdown. So I don't want to have it always there. So I don't want to kind of reach to it just because it's easy. Now, if I want to kind of use one that I've used before and maybe kind of base it on that, then I can always drag it in from a previous project. So I could drag it in from this project, for example. So we're now in another one of my tracks and this was actually a released one. So this is probably organized a bit better than the other one we just had a look at. So let's have a go through and let's see what's within this track. Now the first thing you can see here is my drums group. So you can see within here, as I just described, I've actually taken the kick and the tops group and I've put it within an overall kind of drums group. So you can see again with this track, I'm just using a simpler with a kick drum sample within it. Then I've got the Neutron 3 equalizer again and the utility. As we talked about before, you're, you're kind of seeing these similarities of things that you use all the time. So why not just set a kick channel up just like this? That would then make sense within my template. Next up, we've got my top loops. So within here, I have the auto filter. Again, I've automated this. So Again, we should put the auto filter within there. No saturation again on this. I'm not quite sure why I've not put saturation on. Ah, saturation is actually on the main drums group. So I've actually used saturation here. And again, I've got the equalizer on here, the Neutron 3 equalizer. Because I've added some saturation to here, I just wanted to make sure that maybe some of the saturation that I've done hasn't kind of introduced any more kind of weird EQ kind of elements. And we can see within here, I haven't actually made any tweaks because it's all fine. So. The Neutron 3 probably would be a good thing to drop in there just in case, as is EQ on pretty much every track. Then we've got the different drums tracks here. Again, EQ on there. This is actually a MIDI channel, so I've got my clap here in a simpler. Um, as I mentioned before, sometimes I use, I use MIDI tracks and I'll use individual one hits. Most of the times I use top loops and kind of cut them up and use samples that way. Next up, we have a Rhodes layer here. Let me just unfreeze that. And we can see I've got the chord instrument within here. I'm using the Tal Uno LX, which I absolutely love. It's such an awesome instrument. I use it quite a bit. If you want to check it out, I'm going to put a link in the description below. So definitely check that out. It's such a cool instrument. and I love the sounds that I get out of it. Next up, I've got actually two bass layers here. So I've got a top bass and a low bass. So I can take some inspiration from what I've done here for my template, but I'm not always going to have two bass tracks. With this one, I knew that I wanted the sound of this top bass, but it didn't have the strength that I wanted. So I've actually got a low bass in there as well. So I think with this track, it actually goes between the two different sounds. So again, it's not going to be on every single track, but I can actually see within here a few different things that might be useful. So Again, I've got Neutron 3, which is doing the EQ and all that kind of goodness. Then I've got the LFO tool. Again, pretty much on the same preset I had before. So that's probably going to be another one that I'll put within the template. We've got an imager in there as well. Ah, yeah, so I've got an imager within here. This is the Ozone Imager, a free plugin, which I've gone over on my channel. I love this plugin because it's just so simple and it's free. And with this, I basically just made the whole track mono. Now I could have put a utility in here and I'm not quite sure why I didn't put a utility in here to do this. So I've just set it as minus 100% width, which, which just makes the whole bass track mono. You could easily use a utility for this, but for some reason on this occasion, I use the imager. Next up, I've also got a crash. Now this isn't within my drum group and I don't actually know why I don't necessarily put this within my drum group. I think it's because usually when I'm kind of, I've got the top loops here, I usually automate the low pass on this. So I don't necessarily want to put my 
my crash cymbal within the low pass of my drums. So that's generally why I kind of keep my crash separate. Now I always use a crash on my track. So having that within my template, that does make a lot of sense. So I could have a MIDI track like I've got here, which I could load a sample into really, really quickly. The EQ8 there has got nothing major on. Again, I'll probably tweak that as we went along and a utility in there, well, just because. So I just wanted to take a moment away for a second to say that if you're liking my Ableton tips and tricks, then you should definitely check out a brand new course that I've just launched. I've talked to a whole load of DJs and people that wanted to get into music production. And most of them were saying that a lot of the courses that they've tried were just too complex. The learning curve was just so, so steep. So I thought, well, I wanted to do something about it. I wanted to make my own course in a way that I kind of learned how to produce. When I started to learn to produce, it was all about making DJ edits for my sets. And that's how I kind of learned how to make my productions. So that's kind of how I approach this course. This course is all about making DJ edits, mashups, bootlegs, and remixes. And it only teaches you the things that you need to know when you need to know them. So it's not a case of learning all of the stuff within Ableton. It's just a case of learning different features when you need them. And the feedback has been amazing. I only launched the course in December, but we've had over 250 students through already. And the reviews from them have been wonderful. They've really, really loved the course. So much so that it's actually one of the highest rated music production courses on Udemy. So if you want to check it out, I'm going to put the link up there and in the description below. I definitely recommend you check that out. So we've just been looking at a couple of my latest tracks, looking for those common elements, because those common elements are going to go within our template. Those are the parts that we don't want to replicate and they're going to save a whole lot of time going forward with brand new projects. So let's take those notes and start making the template. So with this Ableton template, we can set up Ableton exactly how we want it. Now, one of the things I always do is I work in arrangement view. So I can actually set it as arrangement view. And when I start this new empty project up, it will actually start within arrangement view, which is one of the greatest things. And it will save me no end because I'm always switching straight to arrangement view. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to get rid of some of these tracks I don't need at the moment. So I'm going to get rid of a few of these tracks, just leaving me with one MIDI track. And what we'll do is we'll start off, first of all, with making the kick. So I'm actually going to rename this to kick. And then I'm going to drag and drop a simpler in there. Now I tend to just make a MIDI track and then drop a audio sample straight in there. So I, jo I drop a kick sample in there and it'll automatically create that simpler for me. But obviously we're setting up a template. So I want a blank simpler in there for now. And I'll drop my sample in a little bit later. Now within this simpler, there's probably not going to be too much I'm going to change within here. Again, it's going to change with every single sample, but I might actually just increase the volume just a little bit. It's actually minus 12 by default. I'm actually going to move it to minus eight. It's just something I find myself doing quite a bit. Now, next up, I want to put a bit of EQ in there and I already talked about it. I use the Neutron 3 EQ. So I'm going to dive into my audio units, go into the isotope folder. And I'm going to find Neutron 3 Equalizer and I'm going to drag and drop that into here. As I mentioned before, I'm not actually going to put any settings on here. I think I'm just going to leave it as is. Actually, no, I'm actually going to take a little bit of the bottom end out. So this first frequency, I'm going to change it to a high pass. And I'm actually going to change the slope as well. Maybe to 48, I think that'll work. And then I'll just roll it down a little bit, maybe to about 30 hertz, 40. No, let's do it 40 hertz. I usually roll about 40 hertz or higher off on my kick. So I'm going to keep it as that for now. It's a good starting point at least. And also I'm going to rename this as well. So I know it's the kick. It says kick EQ already, but I'm going to just rename this to kick. And this will come in handy when it comes to masking a little bit later, because when I'm on the bass channel, it'll actually just say kick within there. Now, depending on the sample, I might put some other audio effects on there. Maybe I might put the drum bus on there, but to be honest, by default, I might not. However, what I will put on is a utility. I pretty much put a utility on every single track because it comes in useful if I do need to automate the gain. And also because it is a kick, I'm probably going to want to mono it as well, actually. So I'm actually going to turn it on mono just so that I know that that kick is going to be mono. And finally, for this channel, I think I'm actually going to reduce the volume as well. So we've got maybe minus six. We'll start off with minus six. Actually, no, do minus eight. I'm going to do it as minus eight. And that can be almost our baseline for everything. I'm going to put every track in as minus eight. Right. So next up, let's get the rest of the drums in there. So for this, I'm actually going to add a whole load of audio tracks. I'm going to add in six audio tracks. Two, three, four, five, six. So I'm actually going to group all of these together. And I'm going to rename this to tops. And I'm actually going to change the color of this because I don't like that color. 
and I'll apply that color to all of the tracks within it. Now, actually, one thing I should have done before I created these audio tracks was actually put an EQ on there. So I'm actually going to delete these audio tracks out of there, just leaving one in there. And I'm going to put an EQ8 on here. And I'm going to duplicate this again. Two, three, four, five, six. So six tracks worth of audio within there. Each of them has got an EQ8 on there, just ready for me to use. And it's just on a default setting at the moment. I don't need to worry about that too much. I'm just going to close those up so they're ready to go. Now, one extra thing I might do to this, because it's something I find myself reaching for more and more, is maybe putting a 909 drum rack in there. I tend to use 909 drums quite a bit, so I'm actually going to put a 909 drum rack in there. So let's try putting that one in there. That's actually going to add it outside of the group, so I'm just going to drag it inside of the group. And I'll color it up again. I'm just going to rename it to 909. And again, I'm going to put the EQ on that as well. It needs an EQ. And that's just ready for me to use. As I say, I tend to use the 909 samples quite a bit. And I find myself certainly in my kind of uh, more later tracks using this 909 kit because it just kind of works really well. But I will still use audio samples as well. So I'm just going to put it in there just so it's ready for me to use when I want it. Next up, let's put some effects on this tops group. So the first thing I'm going to put within here again is another EQ8. I want to make sure that obviously anything coming out of that group has been EQ'd properly. I'm also going to put a reverb on there as well. But with this reverb, I'm going to take the dry wet all the way down. It's something I tend to do in my breakdowns. I might add a bit of reverb to the drums and I'll, it works really nicely actually on the track rather than via ascend. If you want to check out one of my other videos, I'll put a link to that at the top of the screen. I basically go over about using reverb actually on the track rather than via the sense. And then finally, I'm going to put a utility on here as well. Now, what I could also do is maybe put a saturator on here. I did say that I didn't. I usually put it within the drums group, but I might actually put one on here as well, because that might be quite useful. I usually find saturation works really nicely for merging drum sounds together. It just works really well. And in fact, it's good for merging multiple sounds together. So. Maybe I'll put the saturator on there. I'm not actually going to put anything in there. I'm not going to dial in any kind of drive or output or anything else at the moment, because that's something I'm probably going to be doing at the time. So I'll leave that just reset for now. And then finally, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to group the kick and the tops together into a drums group. And I'll just call this drums. Now, I've actually capitalized the drums group within here, the name of the drums group, because when I'm looking through my track really quickly, I find that having the groups as capitalized, it, it just draws my attention to them a bit quicker. So I know that they're actually groups rather than actual tracks. So it just makes it a little bit easier for me to be able to see. And if I want to go straight to my drums, I can kind of see it straight away quite obviously. So within the drums group, again, I'm going to put another saturator on here because that might be very useful. I'm going to put another EQ8 on here. So I think I've got all the drum tracks all set up the way I want to now. The only thing I'm actually going to do is I'm actually going to put a MIDI clip in for the kick just so that it's ready to go. And I'm actually going to zoom in. So we've got about nine bars worth of loop here. I'm actually going to set the loop region up. Remember, everything that we save within here is going to be saved to our default template. So it's going to be loaded up like this every single time we start a new project, which is going to be really, really handy. So if you're one of these producers that works by constructing a loop straight away, then zooming it into the loop region, the kind of the bar length that you usually work on, it's going to be handy just straight from the off. So I've zoomed into about eight bars worth. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put a MIDI clip within the kick channel here. So I've got the kick notes ready to go. Now, in one of my previous videos, I did talk about having a MIDI folder. So I've got a whole load of MIDI tracks within here ready to go whenever I want to use them. And one of the things I've got within here is a kick MIDI clip. So I'm just going to drag and drop this into my kick track here. I'm actually just going to extend it all the way to the eight bars and I'll consolidate it as well. So I've got all of the kicks within there. Now, just so you don't think I'm actually hiding anything away, let's click into this clip and you can see exactly what's going on. As I mentioned before, it's just a 4-4 four, four kick. I've actually got a double kick at the end of the bar, just like almost like a little mini fill. But it's just something in there just to kind of give me a starting block so I can kind of work from there. Um, so I could then maybe move this around if I wanted to to a different place. 
uh, but it's just there ready to go when I want to. So a very, very simple kick pattern. It's just one of those things that I kind of start with and it gives me that kind of base to then start producing the track. So seeing as we were just making the drums, it kind of makes sense to now do the crash track. So this is going to be the crash symbol that appears within my track. So I'm going to create a new MIDI track within here, and this is where we're going to load the crash into. So first of all, I'm going to rename this to crash. Even just having these layers named ready to go is just going to save you a whole load of time. And I'm actually going to copy this MIDI clip across. Now, obviously, we're not going to have the same pattern as the kick. I'm going to rename this to Crash. I'm going to double click into it. And I'm actually just going to delete all these other notes. So I've just got the Crash at the start of the bar. Now, this is something that I probably will tweak. Of course, I'll tweak it. But it's just there, ready to go when I want it. And then let's drop a Simpler on there. And I'm also going to put an EQ8 on there. Now I could put a reverb or a delay on there, but again, it really depends on the crash and the effect that I'm after. Sometimes I just, I just want a really kind of raw crash, which is just a crash symbol without any kind of effects on it whatsoever. So just having the EQ8 on there, I think it's going to be more than enough. Remember, we're not trying to do too much with this template. It's just about giving you that kind of kickstart, that kind of, uh, it just save you that little bit of time going forward without kind of really impacting what track you're going to make. And it's actually still within the drums group and I could keep it within there, but to be honest, I think I want to have it on its own. So I'm going to click and drag it to the bottom. So it's out on its own now. Okay, next up, let's talk about the melodics. So usually when I make a track, it'll have keys or a synth of some sort. So that's the first thing I'm going to get in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click and go to insert MIDI track. Now, I'm not actually going to put an instrument on this. So as I say, it might be a different instrument every single time. So I don't want to kind of nail myself down to having a certain type of instrument. However, there are definitely some plugins that I can put within there that do make sense. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go into the MIDI effects and I'm going to go into the scale plugin. Now, almost all of my tracks that I ever write are always within the minor scale because it just makes sense for the genre that I produce in. It's very rare do I ever produce a track in a major key. So I'm going to just put a C minor MIDI effect on there. And this scale plugin will then keep every single note that I play in that same scale. Now, at the moment, this is set to C minor, but obviously whenever I come to my track, I can then just adjust this whenever I want to. So say, for example, I come to do a new track and I know I want it to be in D sharp, then I can easily just change this to D sharp and I'm ready to go. So I'm just going to keep it as C minor for now. And then obviously I can just change the bass whenever I'm ready. Now, because this is going to be my keys or my synth of some sort, then usually I will be doing a chord of some sort. So I could drag and drop the chord device on here. But to be honest, I've got a whole load of presets and I use a different one each time. So it's just as easy for me to drag and drop a preset onto there than actually just have an empty chord device. So I'm actually going to delete that out of there because I don't need it in there. Next up, let's get an EQ in there. And I'm just happy just to use the EQ8. Sometimes I will go for the Neutron EQ or maybe even the Ozone EQ. It just depends on which one I want to use on the day. But I think for now, the EQ8 will be more than sufficient for it. Now, I did also mention that I do tend to sidechain my keys at least just a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reach for the LFO tool. So let's go to Expo Records, LFO tool. I'm going to drag and drop that onto the track. Now, I say most of the time I tend to work from the presets within here. So I tend to work from the sidechain six preset. This works really well for me. And what I'll do is I generally just roll this off a little bit towards the left here. So we've got a little bit more of a slope. So it does, it's not quite as it tends to clip a little bit if it's all the way to the edge. So I just kind of drag it, drag it a little bit to the left here just to kind of give us a little bit of a little bit of a softening. And generally for the keys, I won't want it to go all the way to the bottom like this. I don't want it to go all the way to zero. So I'm probably going to take the keys one up just a little bit. So it's probably going to start around about here. But because I don't want to hear this straight away, I'm actually going to disable it. So it's there and ready to go if I want to use it. But I'm not, I don't want it. I don't want to hear it straight away. I don't want whatever keys that I put onto this track when I'm kind of jamming out or coming up with ideas. I don't want to instantly hear it side chained because I want to hear it as raw as possible. So when I'm coming up with those ideas, it's not really affected. 
It's the same reason I won't put a reverb or an echo on here because I don't know what the sound's going to be like straight away. So I don't want to kind of, I want to kind of see what it's like in its rawest form first and then put the effects on there that really make the most amount of sense for that sound. And finally, I'm going to rename this to keys. Now this could also be a synth, but it kind of makes sense just to have keys because I like to think of this as being the melody line and I just always call it keys. So it kind of makes sense to me. And obviously I could recolor this if I want to. It's actually done it as this horrible brown color again. So let's do it as maybe an orange so it sticks out nice. So I've got my keys in there, which is going to be my main line or my synth or whatever I want it to be. And the next thing I want to get in there is my bass. And to, to cheat with this almost, I'm just going to duplicate these keys because it's pretty much going to have everything exactly the same on this. I'm going to rename this to bass and I'm going to color it up slightly differently as well. Maybe do it as red. And as I mentioned, it's going to be very, very similar to this. Now, the only thing I'm going to change within this, I'm actually going to remove the EQ8 because I don't, I, I tend to use the Neutron 3 on this, as I mentioned before. So I'm going to dive into my plugins folder, into the isotope folder, and I'm going to drag and drop the Neutron 3 on there. So this is the full version of Neutron. And this is what I'm probably going to, I'm probably going to end up using the mix assistant on this. So I'll be kind of using the mix assistant to give me a starting point for how to tweak my bass. And obviously I'm not going to use that until I've actually got my bass patch on there, whatever instrument that I'm using, that's when I'm going to be then using the Neutron 3. So I'm just going to leave it as its default. Now, because we've copied it from the keys, we still have our scale plugin within here, which is going to be useful on the bass because again, we're going to want to be able to keep within the same scale. And then finally, I have the LFO tool on here as well, which I'm going to be side chaining the bass because I'm pretty much always going to be side chaining the bass. The only difference with this is I'm actually going to take this all the way down to zero because I'm really not going to want it to interrupt the at all. So I tend to take it all the way down. Now, depending on the bass sound, yes, I might want to tweak this a little bit. Maybe I might want to take it up a bit. Depending on the kick, I might want to make this a little bit shorter or a little bit longer, depending on how long my kick is. This all really depends on the kind of sounds that I load in. But at this stage, because we're creating this template, we don't know that yet. So I'm just going to use this setting as a starting point. And then the final thing that I noted down was the fact that I have vinyl noise rolling throughout. Now, I might change this up depending on which sample I want, but generally I tend to use the same sample all the time, which is why it's always in my collections here so I can get it really, really quickly. So I'm going to drag and drop this sample onto a new layer here. And this will create a brand new audio layer for me here. And I'm actually just going to just trim this up a little bit because I don't want that kind of, there's a little peak going on within here and I don't want that. And I'm going to take this all the way down. I think it was about minus 20. So I'm going to take it down to about minus 20 and I'm going to rename this to vinyl. And I'm also going to put an EQ8 on it as well, just to get rid of some of that bottom end rumble. Now, as you'll probably notice, most of these settings that I'm dialing in at the moment, I'm doing really roughly because this is a template. We haven't got any of the sounds in that we would have for an actual track. So we don't actually know how everything's going to sound together. So for example, with this vinyl layer, I don't know whether this is going to be too loud or too quiet. I'll only know when I start getting some sounds in there. So at the moment, I think this is going to work perfectly fine. But when it comes down the road and I start making some tracks, I might need to tweak this template a little bit to get it to work. And finally, I'm just going to make this vinyl layer a little bit smaller and I'm actually just going to drag it to the top because it's one of those things that goes throughout the whole track. And I just want it to kind of sit within the background. So looking through my notes, I think I've pretty much got every element that I've noted down. And I think this is a really good start for a template. It might be something I need to come back to a little bit later and tweak, but I think this is a really good start. Now, there's just a few things that I do need to tidy up and make sure are all ready for when I start producing. The first of which we're actually still on the default tempo, which is 120. So I'm actually going to set this to 124, which is my kind of the tempo that I usually produce at. Now, I do tend to change this. So I might go a bit slower, might go a bit quicker, but that's the kind of almost default. That's usually what I kind of produce at. So it makes sense to set that as a setting. Also, I've also got the automation locked here. That's something from a previous product, I think. So I'm actually going to unlock that because I'm probably going to need that when I start arranging. And finally, we can see that the MIDI is actually armed for the 909. And probably when I come to start playing around with this track, I'm probably going to use my MIDI controller on the keys. I'll probably end up coming up with some kind of melody first on the keys. So I'm actually just going to enable it on that. 
Now, I think we're pretty much ready to save this as our template. I wanted to go over a few things though before I did that. Now we do have the send channels within here. Now I do use the send channels within my projects, but it tends to change from project to project. I don't tend to have the same settings on them for every single project. So it doesn't make too much sense in me setting these up. In fact, I might as well just delete whatever's within these so they're all blank and ready to go because I, I might change it every single time. And I know probably one of the first questions I'll get on this video is what's on your master channel? Well, I don't tend to have anything on my master channel when I'm coming up with the idea for a track. It's not until I get to the very near the end of the process when I'm kind of doing my final mix when I start putting something on the master channel. Now I do know a lot of people who put a limiter on there or some kind of saturation or something to kind of uh, glue everything together. But I tend to do that towards the end of my project because I wanna make sure that everything is mixed properly first. Everything is sounding as good as it can do as far as the mix is going before I start then trying to fix it with glue or with limiting or anything else like that. I wanna make sure it sounds as good as possible in its rawest form because if I'm then sending it off to mastering, I wanna make sure that that pre-master sounds good without anything on the master channel whatsoever so that it already sounds good to my ears. So that's generally why I tend to work with nothing on the master channel to start with so I can really focus on the elements within my mix. So I think I'm now ready to make this my default template going forwards. And it's really easy to do this with in Ableton. I just go to the live preferences, into the file and folder tab, and then where it says save current set as default, I click save. And now if I go to new live set, it now loads this up as our default set. So there you go, there's my brand new Ableton Live template for 2020 created from scratch. Now, as I say, I was always hesitant to use templates within Ableton, within any music software, because I always felt that was gonna make me kind of very sterile as a music producer. I'd produce the same thing every single time, and I wanted to still be creative with it. But I think with this template, I might have cracked it because I'm just, I'm just putting the stuff in there that's really kind of taking up my time, the stuff that I do all of the time, those kind of monotonous tasks, those elements that I always add in there. But it still gives me plenty of scope, plenty of room to still be creative and to play around with stuff. So yeah, I'm quite happy with that template and how it is so far. Now, obviously I am gonna go through and tweak this some more because I'm gonna use it on some tracks first and see how it works. And you know, I might need to tweak it here and there. And that's dead easy to do. All you need to do is load up a brand new project tweak that template and then save it again. So, so easy to do. And I definitely recommend you do it. So go through some of your old tracks and see what elements are common elements. Those things that you do every single time, those things that are just taking your time every time you're producing and putting them into the template. And then you don't have to do them ever again. So yeah, give it a try and see how it works out for you. And if this video has been useful to you, then definitely subscribe to my channel. There's a load more stuff like this on my channel, load of tips, tricks, things like that. So definitely get subscribed and hopefully I'll see you again in the next video.